Humanities Forum and our inaugural Ex Corde Ecclesiae Lecture. To get things off and to bring greetings from the president of the, the college, let me first introduce our executive vice president, Anne Manchester Molek. Thank you, Jim, and welcome to this afternoon's lecture. Um, Father Sakat is sorry that he could not be here today. Uh, something took him away for the weekend, but he did ask me to extend his appreciation to all of you for your presence, and especially to President John Garvey. Where are you, John? Here you are. Coming up from Washington, thank you. Over the course of just a few years, the humanities program has become a vital instrument for high-level discourse here at Providence College. On behalf of Father Sicard, I would like to say how grateful I am personally, and in behalf of the college, I would like to thank Ray Hain, Jim Keating, Pat McFarland, and all those who play such an integral, integral role in making this series possible. The Humanities Forum takes a step forward today with the first of many lectures reflecting on the importance and complexity of Catholic higher education. We could scarcely find a better guest to start this series than President Garvey. I don't want to steal uh, Jim's introduction uh, for Father, for John Garvey, but I share in Father Sicard's admiration of President Garvey and all he is accomplishing as the leader of Catholic University. President Gavi is a role model for all who are in leadership roles at Catholic institutions, and we are grateful for the opportunity to host him here at Providence College. Catholic higher education is indeed a high calling, and it's also a sacred responsibility. Collectively, we work to educate and to nurture students in the context of faith-based communities. The challenges are obvious to all of us, but hopefully, so are the opportunities we have to have meaningful and enduring impact. Like all of you, I'm looking forward to hearing from President Gavi and the discussion that will follow. Thank you all for your commitment to Providence College and its students and for being part of this important event. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Although the Humanities Forum is privileged to host many speakers over any given academic year, this afternoon is a special occasion. This lecture, and we anticipate many more in years to come, is a result of our collaboration with Friends of the Humanities Program, who have a deep love for Catholic education and the aspirations of ex corde ecclesiae, especially within the Dominican educational tradition. We are hopeful that reflection on the importance and thoughtfulness of ex corde and Catholic education more broadly might become increasingly central to our academic life here at Providence College. And to that end, we are pleased to inaugurate this annual lecture on Catholic education. When we thought with whom we ought to begin this endeavor, our minds quickly turned to today's speaker. President John Garvey of the Catholic University of America. Anyone who has followed the topsy-turvy fate of Catholic higher education in the United States since John Paul's call for leaders of Catholic colleges and universities to reignite their love for the unfathomable riches of the salvific message of the gospel and the variety and immensity of the fields of knowledge with which that richness is incarnated by it, that's a quote from Ex Corde, knows the work of President Garvey. After high achievements in the law, which includes presenting the government's case before the Supreme Court, publishing highly regarded essays on religious freedom as well as other constitutional issues, and becoming the dean of Boston College Law School, he took his turn at the really hard stuff, becoming in 2010 the 15th president of Catholic University. As Anne mentioned, this is no easy business, especially if you take seriously that the special vocation, the distinctive calling of a Catholic university is, in the words of John Paul II, to explore courageously the riches of revelation and of nature 
so that the united endeavor of intelligence and faith will enable people to come to the full measure of their humanity, created in the image and likeness of God, renewed ever more marvelously after sin in Christ, and called to shine forth in the light of the Spirit. Courage indeed. Those of us who love Catholic education, hope for its con continual renewal, recognize President Garvey's courage and creativity in exploring the various ways that faith can enhance the college experience. As a graduate of CUA myself, I witnessed the physical transformation of a campus that was, to put matters lightly, quite rough in my day. From afar, I was equally delighted over the years at the tales coming from Michigan Avenue of the bold and interesting ideas being implemented. If I might add a personal remembrance, it happened when I was attending a meeting of the Academy of Catholic Theology being hosted that year by CUA. At some event, I think a banquet, President Garvey was to speak. He bowed out or was late, I can't quite recall, but the reason was striking, at least to me. He was attending the funeral of a man who worked the grounds of the university. A simple act, but one that speaks worlds. I am certain that I speak for many when I express gratitude to President Garvey for his service to the church in the United States and pray for him as he moves on to another, perhaps less stress-inducing, stage of his vocation. As the Catholic man, his parents long ago, but not so far away in Sharon, Pennsylvania, reared him to be. Let us provide President Garvey with welcome. Thank you um, for those nice words, and thanks for inviting me. It's so nice to see so many of you. I assume some are sleeping over from the last class, or there's been a <laughs> requirement that somebody attend. Uh, anyway, it's great. I, I, I'm always insecure about uh, nobody showing up for my talk, so it's really great <laughs> to see so many of you. I, I've been um, invited to speak about this apostolic constitution on Catholic education called Ex Corde Ecclesiae a phrase that means from the heart of the church. Um, in 1990, Pope St. John Paul II uh, addressed this document to Catholic universities around the world. I, myself, at the time was teaching at the University of Kentucky, um, but I had an interest in Catholic higher education and aspired to send my kids to Catholic colleges, which led me to start working at those places so they could get free tuition, because <laughs> we used to tell the kids none of this college tour for you. Your daddy is a school teacher, so you're going to go where he's teaching and you better get in. Anyway, this, this document attempted to describe for Catholic universities what the essential attributes of a Catholic university were. And in the 19th and um, first half of the 20th centuries, this was more or less self-evident. The faculties were predominantly clerical. At my own institution, we had only priests. And the students, and they were only graduate students at the time, um, uh, were themselves priests uh, pursuing studies in philosophy and theology. At Providence College, which was begun 105 years ago, you began with nine Dominicans on the faculty. And because World War I was going on, uh, they started teaching a bunch of nuns at a, at a local convents. Uh, you didn't hire a lay member on the faculty until 98 years ago. Anyway, um, when we admitted lay students, uh, and it was mostly priests and nuns at first, the lay students had a strong sense of Catholic identity. They were often immigrants themselves and objects of nativist prejudice. Um, public schools in the 19th and early first half of the 20th centuries were imbued with a kind of non-denominational Protestantism. I went to public junior high school and high school in Sharon, Pennsylvania, and we would begin every day with reading 10 verses of the Bible and um, saying the Lord's Prayer. And if you were in Mr. Houck's homeroom, you would finish with, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And if you're Mrs. Petrini's homeroom, you would stop after <laughs> deliver us from evil. It was, and, uh, and, and the Catholic kids would read the Douay version of the Bible, and the Protestant kids would read the King James Version, and the Jewish kids just like had to pick and, and take potluck. 
Anyway, um, the third Baltimore Council, which created my university, also created a parochial school system, and the bishops, this is how long ago it was, uh, told parents that they had to send their kids there, and so they did. I, I, um, by 1965, more than half of all Catholic parents sent their kids to parochial schools, and the graduates of these schools went to our colleges, and that was that. It was an economy of self-contained. So until the mid-1960s, we didn't think very much about what it meant for our institutions to be Catholic. We were Catholic in the way that HBCUs are black. Most of our members were um, students, te you know, teachers, staff, fac faculty, alumni were all Catholics, and we weren't particularly welcome at other places, and so this was our place, or these were our places. It would be a mistake to look on this period with a kind of nostalgia, though, as a sort of golden age of Catholic higher education. John Tracy Ellis, who was a well-known historian taught at Catholic University, lamented what he called the absence of any intellectual tradition among American Catholics. My father was a student at Notre Dame from 1937 to 41. I was a student there from, uh, from uh, 19... Well, exactly 30 years later, and exactly halfway between my father and me, uh, Father Ted Hesburgh became the president of Catholic University. He's another graduate of the Catholic University of America. And here's how Hesburgh described the university in a 1952 report to the Ford Foundation. Our facilities were inadequate. Our faculty quite ordinary for the most part. Our deans and department heads complacent. Our graduates, loyal and true in heart, but often lacking in intellectual curiosity. Our academic programs, largely encrusted with accretions of decades. Our graduate school, an infant. Our administration, much in need of reorganization. Our fundraising organization, non-existent. And our football team, national champions. <laughs> <laughs> this um, began to change for several reasons. One was the Second Vatican Council. Pope John Paul, uh, Pope John Twenty uh, Third said, or maybe he just should have said, that he had called the council to open the windows of the church and let in the fresh air. And speaking of his plans to revise the Code of Canon Law, he used the term aggiornamento, bringing up to date, and it soon became a byword for the work of the council. The council fathers invited us to think anew about divine revelation, about the church, ecumenism, religious liberty, the role of the laity, and Catholic education. And our institutions of higher education <clears throat> didn't need much encouragement. The presidents of Notre Dame and Boston College and Georgetown and Fordham and a number of lesser lights met in Land Lakes, Wisconsin in 1967 and issued a manifesto saying, <clears throat> the Catholic University must have a true autonomy and academic freedom in the face of authority of whatever kind, lay or clerical, external to the academic community itself. My predecessor, uh, Bishop William MacDonald, wasn't at Land Lakes. He was busy back home dealing with a faculty strike over the denial of tenure to a Father Charles Curran, an outspoken critic of the church's teaching on contraception. Father Sicard's predecessor, the Reverend William Haas, OP, was not there either. Father Haas became president of Providence College in 1965 and resigned in 1971 to seek a dispensation and get married. It wasn't just the prompting of Vatican II that had Catholic universities feeling their oats. The baby boom that followed World War II produced millions of college students, like me. Um, colleges grew to make room for them, and they had the money to do it, from tuition, from philanthropy, from state support, from federal programs. And Catholic schools in this period aspired not to be just big, but great. Most of them, like this uh, school, were founded by religious orders, and giving authority to lay boards provided both protection against provincial authority and um, financial backing for greater ambitions. Father Hesburgh created a lay board a few months before this meeting I mentioned in Land Lakes, Wisconsin. And the same year, my freshman year in college, he launched the biggest campaign in Notre Dame's history uh, to raise $55 million over five years. That was a lot of money back then. 
a few months after Land O'Lakes, um, Michael Walsh, who was the president of Boston College and who had also attended the meeting and signed the statement, formed a plan to turn control of his university over from 10 Jesuits to a board of 25 lay people. The Jesuit trustees still had some reserve powers, which they relinquished four years later. This uh, shift in governance from religious to lay was paralleled by a shift in faculty ranks, first of all from the members of the founding religious orders, the Dominicans, the Jesuits, the Holy Cross Fathers, the Ursulines, the Sisters of Mercy, from members of the founding religious orders to lay teachers like me, and then um, from members of the Catholic Church to bright young academics from a variety of other religious traditions. In the pursuit of greatness, our best Catholic schools chose as models other private schools that outranked them in the US news and in academic prestige and in the popular imagination. My old friend, Father Bill Neenan, SJ, the former academic vice president of Boston College, said at the time, it's inappropriate to ask a job candidate their religion when we're hiring an economist we're interested in hiring the best economist. I don't think that the people running Catholic universities at this time intended that they should lose their Catholic character. They just had unwarrantedly optimistic views about what it would take to maintain it. In 1986, preparing for its regular reaccreditation visit, Boston College opined that the necessary thing was that, as they put it, a critical mass of the faculty should be familiar with the Catholic intellectual tradition and all should regard spiritual as well as moral questions as worthy of serious exploration. The notion of a critical mass was a popular way of expressing what was needed in the way of Catholics on campus. The metaphor, as some of you know, comes from atomic physics where it means the minimum amount of fissile material that's necessary to sustain a nuclear chain reaction. If, for example, you use a neutron reflector, um, you only need about 11 pounds of weapons-grade plutonium to achieve critical mass. Um, Peter Hans Kovenbach, who was the superior general of the Jesuits from 1983 to 2008, may have had this analogy in mind when he opined that one Jesuit who is truly a Jesuit can be all that is needed to guarantee the authority or Jesuitness of the university. But we all know how that worked out. As a disappointed theologian at St. Mary's observed, we hire computer programmers, experts in finance, literary deconstructionists, all without regard to their faith. We start graduate programs in various professional arenas, all without regard to religion. And one day we wake up and find ourselves in an institution more and more secular in tone. Some of us are as shocked as Claude Rains in the movie Casablanca when he hears that gambling is going on in Rick's cafe. So uh, as a result of all of this, today we find ourselves wondering what Catholic identity means as the term is applied to our schools. Different institutions have different ideas. At some um, schools, Catholic identity is conflated with a mandate to serve the poor and the vulnerable. At others, it's expressed through a theology class requirement, or the work of campus ministry, or affiliation with a particular religious order or spiritual tradition. These may be important characteristics of a Catholic university, but none of them suffices to express the essence of a Catholic university the thing that makes it what it is. In fact, all of these components together won't make a university Catholic if the school lacks a clear idea of its nature and mission as Catholic and as a university. St. John Paul II offered such an idea in Ex Corde Ecclesia, which I've been invited to talk about. A Catholic university's privileged task, he said, is to unite existentially by intellectual effort, two orders of reality that 
too frequently tend to be placed in opposition as though they were antithetical, the search for truth and the certainty of already knowing the fount of truth. At Catholic universities, every field of human knowledge should encounter and be seen in the light of what St. John Paul said was the unfathomable richness of the salvific message of the gospel. The fruit of this encounter, John Paul believed, would be a new flowering of Christian culture in the rich and varied context of our changing times. John Paul recognized that the idea of a Catholic university has practical consequences. If we take it seriously, it will shape the community and the activities of the institution. So in the second part of Ex Corde Ecclesiae, he offered a set of um, what are called general norms, practical guidelines for schools to follow in order to realize the idea of a Catholic university. The norms are not suggestions, they're actually incorporated in canon law, and John Paul directed that they be applied concretely at the local and regional level by Episcopal conferences um, like the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. So pursuant to this direction, the American Catholic Bishops promulgated a document called the Application of Ex Corde Ecclesiae for the United States. Um, nine years later, in 1999. So I, I want to focus my remarks today on one of the norms from part two of Ex Corde Ecclesiae. Uh, in order not to endanger the Catholic identity of the university, St. John Paul wrote, the number of non-Catholic teachers should not be allowed to constitute a majority within the institution. That was the sentence. Uh, the American bishops reiterated the point in their application and said it the other way around. The American Catholic bishops said in the application of Ex Corde Ecclesiae, the university should strive to, to recruit and appoint Catholics as professors so that, to the extent possible, those committed to the witness of the faith will constitute a majority of the faculty. All professors are expected to be aware of and committed to the Catholic mission and identity of their institutions. I think that this is the most important norm laid down in the apostolic constitution. It is essential for realizing the Catholic university's role in advancing a Christian culture. I also think that if a university adheres to this recommendation, it will be Catholic. If it does not, it won't be. And it's as simple as that. To explain why I think this is so, I want to give a few examples and then explain what my theory is. Um, let me give two historical examples about flourishing Christian cultures. I think, or I hope anyway, that they can help us to understand what conditions help a culture to thrive and produce uh, what John Paul called distinctive and wonderful works. Let me begin with 17th century Rome. Uh, one of the nice things about my job is because we're uh, we have on our faculty, uh, or uh, in our institution, what are called ecclesiastical schools, meaning they give uh, degrees that authorize the, res the recipients of the degrees to teach in seminaries or at other uh, pontifical faculties. Uh, for that reason, uh, the grants of tenure in our schools of theology and philosophy and canon law have to be approved by the Vatican. So I go over there to do business with them. Actually, my own appointment had to be approved by the Vatican, and my brothers and sisters were mightily surprised that, <laughs> that I survived the scrutiny and got the job. <laughs> um, anyways, so uh, I, f uh, a number of times a year, I'll, I'll uh, go to Rome for meetings of the Congregation for Catholic Education. I, I also serve on a couple of agencies there. There's one called AVAPRO, the Agency for the Evaluation and Promotion of Quality in Ecclesiastical Schools and Faculties. So I'll go there for these AVAPRO meetings. I, I should say, I mean, this sounds pretty cool, and sophisticated, but, and the members of this uh, agency, it's sort of like a Catholic accreditation agency for ecclesiastical faculties, and the members of it are currently from uh, Poland, Norway, France, Spain, um, Italy, Nigeria, and uh, the United States, and um, uh, so they all have 
uh, native language, you know, Norwegian or French or Spanish or whatever. But of course, since it's Rome, they would do their business in Italian when they have their meetings. But because I'm on the committee and I'm such a monoglot, they all speak in their third language for the meetings. They, they do their business in English for my benefit because I don't say I add a lot to these meetings. But, but, but it gets me to Rome, which I enjoy. And um, I have to say, I've never gotten tired of um, uh, I just, I, I've fallen in love with the city of Rome. When I was a boy, I used to think Paris was the most beautiful city in the world. I went to school there. I worked for a law firm there when I, when I was in law school. And, I, and I, I hadn't gone back to Rome until the year 2000. One of our girls was going to school there. And um, I hadn't been there for 35 years. And uh, uh, man, it was the year 2000, so they were fixing everything up, too, which in Rome doesn't happen all that often. Um, <laughs> Anyway, it was, it was just beautiful then, and I was reminded uh, all these years later when I started going how beautiful it is. And I, I, one of the things I love about it are the, uh, these Baroque churches that seem to occupy every different piazza. I, I confess that I confuse them often. The, uh, there's uh, Santa Maria della Vittoria, Santa Maria della Pace, San Andrea della Valle, San Andrea al Quirinale. And um, so they tend to have similar names and tend to have uh, a lot of similarities in their features. I, uh, Renaissance architecture, um, if, you, if you know Rome, think about the Palazzo Farnese, I, um, tended to be um, <coughs> rectangular buildings, uh, kind of mathematically precise ratios of height and, and width and so on. But in the Baroque period, they started introducing um, rounded curves and ovals that that seemed to be in motion, you know, that was part of what they were trying to sell. Think about, uh, you, you're all familiar with the, uh, with the pillars that hold up the Baldacchino in St. Peter's. The, these are Bernini's um, uh, pillars, and they, they uh, it's almost like, um, I don't know, fire going, or smoke uh, going up, you know, they twist around like, uh, like this. Or, um, or um, San Carlo alle Quattro Fontane is, uh, um, there's, there are these, convex and concave curves on the, on the front of it. This, was a, this is designed by Borromini, another a contemporary of, of, um, of um, Bernini's and also of um, Pietro di Cortona. Uh, uh, his, he, he was the guy who designed the facade of Santa Maria della Pace, which looks sort of like a stage, you know, with concave wings on it. Um, so that uh, they, they have these outsides and, and interior features like this. And another thing that they have really um, magnificent um, ornaments, you know, sculpture and painting that's kind of built into the, built into the church. Like uh, Bernini's got a chapel in Santa Maria della Vittoria that's, um, there's, um, there's a famous ecstasy of St. Teresa in this. It caused sort of a scandal at the time, but the ecstasy of St. Teresa is in the chapel and it's, it's situated in a way uh, that uh, light coming in from a hidden window seems to shine heavenly rays on the, on the sculpture of St. Teresa. It isn't any accident these churches are using similar kinds of styles and tech techniques. Um, one of the great patrons of these buildings was Alexander the Seventh, uh, Fabio Chigi, the pope from in the mid um, 17th century. So he was a patron of both Bernini and Cortona, and he once made a joke that uh, in the competition that he was having, Bernini and Cortona shouldn't be allowed to see one another's drawings because they had a tendency to copy one another. Um, so I remember uh, some years ago, I was giving a talk at Castel Gandolfo, and I, uh, I went into the city at lunchtime and paid a visit there to the Church of St. Thomas of Villanova. Um, and it, it was designed by Bernini. It was built in the um, 1658 to 1662 or so. Um, anyway, it has a uh, it has a sort of ceiling. Uh, picture the Pantheon. You know, it has an oculus at the top, and there are these um, eight ribs that come down from the ceiling like this. And and going up the ribs in diminishing size are these hexagonal um, coffers uh, all the way up to the top. Uh, turns out that um, that Cortona in Santa Maria della Pace designed the same kind of roof um, or ceiling a few years earlier. 
there wasn't any shame in this. It, uh, in the Baroque art of Rome, um, imitation was a formal part of artistic practice. Bernini um, gave a lecture to the French Academy and advised the students that they should spend at least half their time copying what other people, what other people did. And he himself did it. I've mentioned a couple of examples, but in his uh, paintings, you know, there's a, there's a, or his sculpture, there's a sculpture of Aeneas and Anchises um, and Ascanius in the, in the Gallery of Borghese, copies um, Raphael's fresco fire in the Borgo, the same, the characters that you see in Aeneas carrying Anchises are like uh, knocked off from Raphael. Same thing with his Apollo and, and uh, Daphne. Uh, rips off the Apollo Belvedere. Uh, this kind of imitation laid a sort of foundation for creativity. And it was made possible, these sculptors and architects in the Baroque period had a shared conception of what was beautiful. Uh, they had a shared vocabulary of types. They had a shared understanding of the purpose of art. In In all of these cases, the idea of what counts as beautiful was informed by an idea uh, of, by a faith in a creator who had impressed his ideas on works of creation. And the types that inspired the artists were often also taken from the Catholic faith. There were certain martyred saints, St. Andrew, I mentioned a couple of the churches uh, dedicated to St. Andrew. St. Sebastian was a great one, you know, they loved the the arrows and so on. Um, and art and architecture in the 17th century shared an evangelical purpose. This is, uh, you remember, following right on the heels of uh, the Reformation and the Council of Trent advised um, that there was great profit of holy images for raising the mind to God and cultivating piety by setting before people the examples of the saints. So uh, all of these things um, combined to create this kind of culture that we still see the traces of in Rome. So I said, I wanted to give a couple of examples, and that's, that's one. Um, let me now jump forward 400 years and across the ocean. Um, in the two decades right after World War II, um, the United States saw a development of a really vibrant Catholic literary culture. Best known figure in the Renaissance was um, Flannery O'Connor, um, whose letters give us some sense of who her correspondents were, who she hung out with, whose stuff she read. And um, one of her friends, of Father J. H. McCown, a Jesuit, um, offered him this uh, observation in 1964 in a letter. She said, anybody who wants to be introduced to Catholic fiction will have to start with the French, Mariac and Bernanos. The English are Waugh and Green and Muriel Spark, and among the Americans, J.F. Powers, Walker Percy, Wilfred Sheed, and some would include, she said, Edwin O'Connor. If you read through her really prolific correspondence, the list expands. It included um, Caroline Gordon, a novelist and critic, um, the, the poets like Alan Tate, who was uh, for a time married to Caroline Gordon, and Robert Lowell, and and Robert Fitzgerald, um, and Thomas Merton, and Dorothy Day. And there was a French uh, import crowd that were also familiar with all of these philosophers like Jacques Maritain and Etienne Gerson and Tyre de Chardin, who immigrated to the United States to teach. They seem, you know, in, um, any one of these individually seem like great figures when we look at them at a distance of 60 years, but they were really well acquainted with one another and with one another's work. Caroline Gordon would review and comment on O'Connor's manuscripts for her. O'Connor would review Gordon's and others' work, mostly for the Catholic press. Uh, she sent J.F. Powers her review of his book, The Presence of Grace. Um, she wrote, I'd like you to know that I admire your stories better than any others I know of. Um, Evelyn Waugh, a Brit, uh, visited Dorothy Day at the Catholic Worker in Manhattan and Thomas Merton at the Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. Um, Jacques and Rice of Maritain were Alan Tate's godparents when he came into the Catholic Church in 1950. The Maritans were part of a parallel 
Catholic literary movement in France. They uh, were converts themselves, and the French poet uh, Leon Blois was their godfather. Uh, Dorothy Day and Thomas Merton corresponded for years. Um, Dorothy Day um, longed for the life of obedience that he lived as a Trappist monk at Gethsemane. Um, for his part, Thomas Merton admired, admired and envied her closeness to the poor. Uh, Caroline Gordon's novel, The Malefactors, was inspired by Dorothy Day's Catholic worker movement. O'Connor took an idea of what a novel was from Jacques Maritain. So uh, the, it, uh, if you're familiar with uh, some of these authors, you realize that their work varied greatly in subject and style. Uh, Waugh and Green dealt directly with the problems of faith in, in, in books like The Power and the Glory and Brideshead Revisited. O'Connor and Percy did so more obliquely, you know, um, Flannery O'Connor's characters are famously weird and odd, but but they all th these people all wrote as Catholics because their faith shaped how they understood the world and our place in the world. The world that they wrote about was a creation imbued with the presence of God, and the human beings who were in their stories were sinners seeking salvation, whether they knew it or not. They were not people who were looking for personal growth or freedom or romance or uh, the, the direction of the books uh, was something that was um, imparted by the faith of the writers. So those are the two examples I want to give. Now I said I want to step back and see if I can offer a kind of general principle. I, I want to highlight two features that we see in the architectural culture of 17th century Rome and in the literary culture of 20, 20th century America. First of all, they were, as I've pointed out, collaborative. The architects of the 17th century, the authors of the 20th century, learned from each other. They, they inspired each other, and they built on each other's work. They, uh, they, that, uh, in that sense, they were collaborative. Second, this sort of collaboration was possible because they had a common understanding of their project. They shared a set of standards by which they could evaluate the merit of one another's work. And those standards were grounded in a basic shared understanding of reality. I think these are the two crucial conditions that allowed these rich cultures to develop. Um, try and explain why by using an illustration I've used before and taken from the scientist and philosopher Michael Polanyi. Some of you might be familiar with his, um, I remember reading Personal Knowledge years ago and being really impressed with it. Polanyi was born in Hungary into a family of secular Jews in 1891. Um, he, got a, he got a medical degree and then he got a PhD in chemistry. In fact, his son won the Nobel Prize for chemistry in 1986. Um, Polanyi in 1919 converted to Christianity and in the 1920s he taught at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Berlin. Uh, while there he had the good fortune to meet and work with many of the greatest scientists in the world. Um, Fritz Haber, Max Planck, Erwin Schrodinger, Albert Einstein, um, and he got to see firsthand how some of the most brilliant minds in the world interacted with one another. He was, as I say, a pretty famous scientist, but he's actually better known for his writings about epistemology, like um, Personal Knowledge, the thing, book I mentioned, and, and social science. Anyway, in 1962, he gave a lecture in the United States at Roosevelt University that was entitled The Republic of Science. And it's about building intellectual communities. Um, Polanyi observed that science is a particular kind of joint task that requires what he called the spontaneous coordination of independent initiatives. He compared it to a group of people working around a table putting together a jigsaw puzzle. Um, he said, when, when this, when, when they're in, in this project of putting together the jigsaw puzzle, 
um, each person works on putting the puzzle together in sight of the others, so that every time is a, a piece is fitted in by one helper, all of the others immediately watch out for the next step that becomes possible in consequence, maybe for them, maybe for somebody else. And the more helpers that we have working on the puzzle, the faster it all goes, provided we're looking at one another. He says, notice how this is different from a dozen people uh, who, are get, who are hired to shell peas, for example. Um, there, each worker can tend to her own pile. The total number of peas shelled and the time it takes to shell them won't vary if the workers are isolated from one another, if each one's put in a cubicle and not looking at the others, or in a separate room with the doors closed. With the jigsaw puzzle, the workers have to work inside of each other so that each time somebody fits a piece in, the others can see what further steps become possible. This is what we mean by saying the work is coordinated, not that there's one central direction, but uh, rather that it's um, coordinated spontaneously among the workers. But it's also independent. There is no single authority dictating what piece goes where, or you lose the benefit of the multiple workers. And um, so each person acts on her own initiative. That's what makes them so effective. This kind of collaborative effort wouldn't be possible, he says, if each person had a different idea about what the task was. He said, imagine if somebody thought that the pieces had to be stacked rather than interlocked. That, that would slow things down. I, um, in the same way, Polanyi observed, um, a community of scholars working together have to share the same idea of what problem they're working on and what counts as a good solution. This sort of consensus among a multitude of scientists is what he calls scientific opinion. Um, it's not one set of principles held by everybody. He says that each of the scientists is competent to judge only about his or her own, own area, you know, molecular biology or subatomic physics, or uh, each person judges by his or her own small corner of studies and will have some sense of the standards in immediately adjacent areas. But if we consider the larger community of scientists, we'll find that the, the network of overlapping competencies um, together generate uniform standards of scientific merit. So um, this scientific opinion provides the criteria for judging the plausibility and scientific value and the originality of new theories. Um, and it provides the foundation on which Scientists build their own original contributions. Um, Copernicus and Kepler, Polanyi observed, told Newton where to look for answers that were unthinkable to themselves. So uh, a governing perspective or worldview provides an environment that cultivates discovery in this group. And universities, he said, are uniquely suited to incubate intellectual movements and form scientific opinion because, as he put it, they can provide an intimate communion. They can bring together faculty who are asking the same kinds of questions and share a normative view of reality or approach to their subject, and their work will inspire and complement and build on the works of their peers. You can probably see where I'm going with this. Um, the central thing St. John Paul insists on in Ex Corde Ecclesiae, is that the people who build the university community are formed by the Catholic faith as Polanyi's scientists were formed by the scientific tradition. And to create a distinctively Catholic intellectual culture, we need to build an intellectual community that's governed by a Catholic worldview. We have a shared commitment to Catholic ideas about creation and providence of human beings made in the image of God will spur creativity and the development of a culture that expresses these ideas and not other ones. Um, some people worry that uh, if you're building a culture like this, it'll suppress academic achievement and scholarly advancement. In fact, the opposite is true. Polanyi's Pel uh, lecture, The Republic of Science, was actually an argument against British 
post-war efforts to have the government engage in central planning and science. Uh, Polanyi says, look, I've been through that. I, I've, I saw the Russians do it with, with biology in Lysenko's time. I, uh, the, the, the Stalinist efforts to conform biology to ideology had the consequence of setting back genetics in the Soviet Union for, um, for an entire generation. So you can't have it uh, dictated from above. That's what he said, I mean by um, collaborative but spontaneously coordinated. If you, you lose the benefit of all the people, uh, different minds working on the same problem, if you have just one mind telling them all what to do. Um, so, uh, but having a shared culture like this is also the foundation for the scholarly achievement that we hope for. And successful academic communities, he said, share a common orientation in their intellectual enterprise. So, um, let me say something about the students, because when we talk about building a Catholic university, we naturally focus on the faculty because they are the people who create the culture. Um, the Friars basketball team adds life and entertainment to Providence College. And I think the sport adds an important element to the collegiate experience of the players. I should say I'm a huge fan of college basketball, although I'm a Kentucky fan, no offense. But, um, but for the rest of the student body, um, basketball is really just a marketing investment to draw customers to the college so they can learn what the professors have to teach them. At the same time, we should not lose sight of the fact that the university exists not for the sake of having a basketball team, nor even for the sake of providing employment to the faculty. The university exists in order to educate the nearly 5,000 students whose tuition pays to run the place. And on this point, Ex Corde Ecclesiae quotes Vatican II's declaration on Catholic education, Gravissimum Educationis. Here's what it says. Catholic universities exist so that the students of these institutions become people outstanding in learning, ready to shoulder society's heavier burdens, and to witness the faith to the world. So how does the Catholic community envisioned by St. John Paul prepare our students for these responsibilities. Let me close with two observations on this point. Here's the first one. For many of our faculty, um, there is a natural connection between their academic discipline and the faith they're handing on. Catholic University, my own, has four semesters of philosophy and theology in its core curriculum because we want our graduates to be acquainted with the church's sacraments and teachings and the philosophical foundations of what Catholics believe. But I'm often asked, what is Catholic about architecture or law or business or biology? Um, let me offer the example of architecture, which I touched on earlier. Two years ago, we were hiring a dean in architecture. And in advance of the search, I had a meeting with the faculty. I said, um, I'm, I'm a lawyer, people are always wanting to call me Dr. Garvey. I'm not even a doctor, I didn't write a dissertation, I'm just a guy. I, I, uh, and I'm certainly not an architect, so it's not my job to tell you how you ought to run the School of Architecture. But I will say I see no point in the Catholic University of America supporting a School of Architecture unless it is in some serious way Catholic and adds something to the intellectual life of America that you couldn't find at the University of Maryland or um, Emory. I said, I could imagine several ways in which that might be true. Um, I said, you could, for example, embrace a Franciscan vision, by which I mean Pope Francis, not St. Francis. You could uh, be interested in affordable housing, in sustainable design that moderates the use of materials and energy and space, in LEED certified buildings and eco-friendly city planning. These are obviously Catholic in the way that the Holy Father is. They show a concern for the poor and for the earth is our common home. That's a, that's a Catholic vision of architecture. On the other hand, I said, 
um, you might want to adopt a Benedictine vision, by which I mean Pope Benedict, not Saint Benedict. Um, the Pope Emeritus has said, better witness is born to the Lord by the splendor of holiness and art, which have arisen in the community of believers, than by clever excuses, which apologetics has come up with to justify the dark sides, which sadly are so frequent in the church's human history. People do not fall in love with the faith by reading St. Thomas Aquinas, no offense, he, um, or, or the Jerome Biblical Commentary, um, Bishop Robert Barron, another well-known graduate of Catholic University, made this really interesting observation about Hans Urs von Balthasar. He said, Balthasar intuited something in the middle of the 20th century, just as the postmodern critique was getting underway. Namely, that initiating the theological project with truth or goodness was a non-starter since relativism and skepticism in regard to these transcendentals was powerful indeed. But there is something less threatening, more winsome about the beautiful. Beautiful churches in which we make beautiful music are a much more pleasing invitation to the sacraments than lectures. Uh, Pac Claudel, you may recall, was famously converted listening to sung vespers on Christmas Day below the southern rose window at Notre Dame Cathedral. I used to hear the same kind of critique when I was a law professor. Sure, people would say, um, I can see what the First Amendment has to do with religion, but the rest of American law is necessarily a secular affair. To think otherwise would be an establishment of religion. But this just isn't so. Um, think about what our faith has to say about immigration, or about a graduated income tax, or about clean air, or about the taxation of nonprofits. Think about the purposes and limits of punishment in the criminal law. Didn't the Pope? just revised the catechism four years ago to declare capital punishment inadmissible in all cases? Or to take just one more obvious example, reflect for a moment on what the church teaches about marriage and families. Just last June, the Supreme Court had to remind the city of Philadelphia that Catholics had been taking care of foster children for longer than the city had been around, and it was not the government's business to force Catholic social services to certify same-sex couples as foster parents. So um, hey, let me offer a third example, this one from the field of physics. Some years ago, I had a dinner for a physicist from the Lateran University in Rome, a Monsignor Basti, and I invited some of our physicists and philosophers to join the party. Uh, the physicists, you know, the physicists come in two kinds, they're the ones that Think about the universe, you know, you saw this picture from the Hubble, was it the Hubble Space Telescope or was it this new one that they have? Uh, um, there's a picture of a star, I don't know how they know that this, this star, uh, the oldest star ever, ever seen 12 billion years ago, you know, like a billion years after the Big Bang. Uh, that's one kind of physics. The other kind deals with like really tiny things, that, <laughs> things that when, like the, the Large Hadron Collider and in Switzerland that smashes things up and takes pictures. Um, so these were the big guys, not the little guys. Um, and they were really interested in, uh, Stephen Hawking was still alive at the time and um, had written a book not long before about how the universe began and about the possibility that there could be multiple universes, either with the same physical laws as ours or a different set of physical laws, which would be really weird. Anyway, it all sounded rather metaphysical to me. I was enjoying hearing what they had to say, but I have no idea what um, they were talking about. But it sounded rather metaphysical, as I said. And about 15 minutes into this discussion, Monsignor John Whipple, who was sitting on my right, Whipple teaches philosophy, um, and used to be the provost at Catholic University, um, piped up and said, you know, um, the Bishop of Paris condemned St. Thomas Aquinas in 1277 for denying the possibility that there could be multiple universes. <laughs> It's the thing I love about St. Thomas Aquinas, like everything is in there. Just, <laughs> just think of, uh, it, it's all in there. Um, uh, I have to say, or, I mean, sure enough, it was true that um, in the Summa, Thomas argued that, um, that many worlds would be less perfect than a single unitary 
universe produced and ordered by God. The, the Bishop of Paris, uh, um, Etienne Tompier is his name, um, I, I kind of see it the bishop's way, I have to say. I, he said that Thomas's way of thinking about this puts God in a box, and if God wanted to make multiple universes, heck yeah, he could do that. He's, uh, anyway, that was the... the um, but, but you see my point about this, I hope. Even discussions of physics at the most basic level uh, bring us back to God. Teaching is a way of bringing a student closer to God and cultivating his or her soul. It, it follows a deeper directive of the heart, one that seeks God in all things, including how the universe began. And this is true even if our more immediate goal is uh, thinking about equations or principles of con law. We find God in all of creation and all of our intellectual pursuits lead back to him at one time or another. So I said I wanted to make two points about our students, and that's one. It's, <coughs> it's really everybody's business to think about this. Uh, the other point is this. In our discussions about what makes a Catholic university distinct, we are inclined to say it's the contribution of faith. St. John Paul II um, fixed the point in our minds in his encyclical Fides et Ratio, he says, faith and reason are like two wings on which we rise to seek the truth. I like the metaphor, I, I get the point, and I'm, I agree with it, but I have to say that as a way of describing the work of a Catholic university, it is insufficient. I mentioned a moment ago our tendency to focus on the faculty and to forget about the students, and reducing the university's work to faith and reason is related to this tendency and it results from a too narrow view of what faculty do or ought to do. Faith is just one, though of course it's an important one, of the virtues we want our students to acquire before they graduate. Think about the changes that young people go through between the ages of 18 and 22. Um, they fall in love, and many of them will meet their life partners. But love in the popular culture is different from the virtue of charity. Hooking up feels like love to those who have no experience of either, but it's not the same. It's more like the sirens that tempted Ulysses. Uh, social science data indicate that the chances of divorce after five years of marriage vary directly with the number of premarital sexual partners. Students need to learn the virtue of true love during their time in college and the virtue of temperance. That's one or two things. Um, here's another. High school graduates arrive at college, uh, many of them without their wisdom teeth. You know, I teach a class to freshmen and I always pull up their pictures before class so I can learn their faces before. And, I, and many of them don't have their wisdom teeth. You know, I see these baby faces. and. Uh, three years later, four years later, they got longer jaw lines. They look like completely different people. Um, sometimes the guys aren't even shaving when they get there. I, um, and four years later, they're choosing careers and uh, going out in the world to work. And while they're less likely than prior generations to stay forever at their first job, they have set off in a direction that they'll likely continue to follow. This, like love, is a lifelong commitment. and how do they acquire the prudence to make that commitment wisely? That's another virtue. When I began college, I wasn't old enough to vote. Uh, this was before the 26th Amendment, but I was only 17 anyway. Um, since the passage of the 26th Amendment, this is something that most college freshmen will do for the first time. And participating in civic life is a responsibility that we in all countries, not just America, assigned to adults and not to teenagers because it takes some growing up to acquire the virtues of wisdom and prudence and justice and cultivating this is another of the university's responsibilities. As St. John Paul said in Ex Corde Ecclesiae, the Christian spirit of service to others for the promotion of social justice is of particular importance for each Catholic university to be shared by its teachers and developed in its students. Nowadays, on the organizational chart of a Catholic university, 
we tend to assign responsibility for cultivating the cardinal and the theological virtues to people other than the faculty. The Office of Student Affairs has charge of student affairs, romantic and otherwise. At Providence College, it comprises the Counseling Center, Residence Life, Student Health, Title IX, and Sexual Harassment. Um, we have a Center for Career Education and Professional Development that is charged with helping students find their vocation in life. Was not always so. Faculty once played a more important role in the formation of students, teaching them not just the virtue of faith, but hope and charity and prudence, justice, fortitude, temperance. At the middle of the last century, the 20th century, Providence College had a population of 86 Dominican friars, many of them living in residence halls with the students. They were not alone in that arrangement, I have to say. My last employer, the Jesuits at Boston College, lived with the students. Um, when I was in college, I had a young Holy Cross priest, Father Claude Pomerleau, who was my friend throughout his life, as my RA in my freshman dorm at Notre Dame. We spoke then of universities acting in loco parentis, and the phrase was not inaccurate. But as religious orders that founded most of our universities declined in number, and the faculty became predominantly lay, like me, the faculty also tended to be married and to live lives off campus and away from students. And it was convenient for them to hand off the business of student formation to professionals. They had their own children, after all, um, and to concentrate on research activities that mattered most for professional advancement. But I have to say that in doing so, I think we have deserved our students. Professional faculty, or prospective faculty, sorry, interviewing with me for jobs in mechanical engineering might ask me what being Catholic has to do with teaching students about fluid mechanics and heat transfer. And part of my answer is that the job of a teacher in mechanical engineering is to see that his students leave the university on the road to heaven as mechanical engineers. As St. John Paul put it more eloquently in Ex Corde, the objective of a Catholic university is to assure an institutional commitment to the service of the people of God in their pilgrimage to the transcendent goal which gives meaning to life. This means that the teacher's responsibilities do not end when the class bell rings. We should concern ourselves with our students as if they were our own children. So, um, the job of building a Catholic university becomes increasingly urgent as the broader culture in which we live becomes increasingly secular. John Paul II was not blind to the challenges posed by the wider culture in which Catholic colleges and universities operate. He was, after all, the pope who introduced the term culture of death into the church's lexicon. The consensus that made possible a flourishing Catholic literary culture in, in America less than a century ago has not held. This Christian worldview is no longer a consensus that informs our culture. This is a point Pope Francis made pretty forcefully in his encyclical Laudato Si. We no longer recognize the earth as the creation of a loving God. The more significant problem, however, is that many Catholics do not have a Catholic worldview themselves. Increasingly, the sphere of faith and religious practice is contracted to something we do on Sunday, if that, and it doesn't affect how we actually live. At the other extreme, there are Catholics who um, get so caught up in combating the negative aspects of the culture that we live in that they forget the value of culture itself. They become uh, like a city that puts all its resources into building fortifications and none into creating something worth defending. That's the job we have to focus on. It's difficult to maintain a Catholic worldview, let alone to create works that will reflect a vision like that, when we're surrounded by a culture that's shaped by a contrary vision of reality. Culture doesn't just express our judgments of 
what's intrinsically worthwhile and true. It shapes our judgments. And when the culture that we're living in doesn't express a sense of man's transcendence or wonder at creation, it's no surprise that we lose that sense too. If we want to create a living Catholic culture, we need to create a Catholic vision of reality that can inspire it. And this is the work of our university communities. Um, in the Second Vatican Council's uh, document, Gaudium et Spes, it says that faith throws a new light on everything. Uh, that means that we need to approach every discipline, every way of looking at reality as Catholics, the mechanical engineers, the English professors, the, the theologians, the philosophers, all need to situate their research within a vision of the human person and of the world that is enlightened by faith in Christ. Polanyi made this observation about scientific inquiry, and I've tried to say it about culture, that this common pursuit of truth in the light of faith will have a cumulative effect. We can't predict exactly what sort of culture such a community would produce. We need to be modest about our own abilities. Um, I said to our architecture faculty, I'm no architect, I can't tell you what it ought to be, but uh, you tell me, uh, what do you have to offer as a Catholic university? Anyway, as Polanyi observed, the result of our coordinated um, pursuit of truth is not premeditated, but history suggests that it'll be something distinctive and wonderful if we try really hard at it. So, I was asked to talk about ex corde, and there you are. I'm happy, what's the... <laughs> Yes. Oh, there's one. Like, if you had to choose one thing, like present day, what would be like the biggest struggle of a Catholic university today? And like maintaining that like culture. Um, the question was, if we had to pick one thing that was the biggest, um, obstacle or impediment or challenge in maintaining a Catholic culture, what would it be? Um, I'd have to say it was um, has to do with the last thing I said. There, There is a tendency in our discussions about building Catholic universities to focus on uh, the sort of thing that the Cardinal Newman Society used to focus on. Um, here's what makes you Catholic. Don't allow this kind of speech to happen on campus, or or don't uh, don't invite this person to come and talk, or uh, don't say this or don't say that. To focus on keeping uh, the culture outside us at bay. Uh, I, um, the reason is that um, nobody ever attracted anybody to you know if, if we want to. If we want people to fall in love with what we have to offer, it will never be by saying, don't do this, don't do that, this is forbidden. That's We need to offer our own um, uh, example or um, proposal about, he, here's a really beautiful way of thinking about things, uh, about uh, take your pick, about, about, um, uh, about literature or about music or about, buildings or about the economy or about uh, the legal system. We, we, need, we need to shift our focus from uh, away from saying, don't do this, don't do that, to here's something you might like. Uh, that's the biggest challenge. And it's hard, you know, because 
because people who are serious about building a Catholic culture are a distinct minority in um, in Western culture today. You know, we're on all sides um, uh, beleaguered. So there's always a tendency to strike out, to lash back, to knock your opponent down. You, um, we shouldn't be interested in that at all. Uh, our job is not to win a fight. Our job is to offer something that'll be really beautiful. Thank you for speaking with us, Dr. Garvey. I'm not um, a doctor. I'm okay, I'm just Mr. A guy. Garvey. <laughs> I don't want to be disrespectful, so I'm just making sure. <laughs> well, thank you, anyways. Um, so I guess my question was just about like if you had any like particular advice about like how to make faith digestible to um, maybe non-Catholics in a classroom setting, or um, even amongst like faculty, like how to make that digestible and how that can be propagated to the students. Yeah. So. Um, uh, this is a really important question, too, about building a Catholic culture. And uh, the, the reason I like approaching it uh, the way I've offered is, um, look, and, uh, we talk about hiring, about hiring Catholics and inviting Catholics and other people in to see what we have on offer. It isn't because other people are bad or have wrong ideas or it, it is... Um, there's a story I, uh, that I, I often remember about uh, Paul Douglas when he used to teach at the University of Chicago in the economics department. I, um, so University of Chicago's economics department is, is famous for a view about um, free markets. And um, uh, for years, there, uh, there, there are probably two dozen people who have won Nobel Prizes from uh, who were faculty or students or TAs or uh, connected in one way or another with the University of Chicago's economics department. And Paul Douglas, who was a kind of Keynesian economist, later a senator from Illinois, um, taught there for a while when Frank Knight was the, was the chair of the department. And he went in to complain to Frank Knight uh, saying, you know, Frank, they won't hire any people uh, around here li um, like me. And Frank said, right, uh, that's not our project. We're, we're, not, we're not about. Keynes and you know what can the government do for the our our project is a different one. Um, there's a place for that. It's called Yale or something else. You know, it's um, it's not um, that these are bad or different. It's just that if we want to build the University of Chicago's economics department, that's what we need. Or or here's another example, um, uh, which I have less um, sympathy for. The, the, the most important architectural movement in the 20th century was the Bauhaus School. Uh, you, you if you've been to Chicago, you, uh, you will recognize Bauhaus architecture. It's about uh, straight lines, black and white colors, uh, very functional buildings. The, the, the form of the building follows the function. Uh, that, that was their saying, form follows function. Uh, um, we do this sort of thing. And, you know, all of these boxes that... Uh, that populate uh, big cities were the um, creation of the Bauhaus School, they would not have hired Bernini onto their faculty. He was really good at <laughs> what he did. But, but that wasn't what they were building. They were something else. And there's another place for, for Bernini. But I, I um, um, so it is with people who are not Catholic who might get an interest, as, as they very well might, in, in the project that we have on offer. It, this is not about a club that's close to people of one kind or another. It's not about uh, we're good and you're bad. It's about here's our project. How about this? Isn't this cool? I, uh, you like it? Yeah, come and <laughs> come and see. I'd love to tell you about it. That's uh, and uh, so um, uh, that's the thing. You know, this is um, this is not a sort of um, discrimination akin to the problem about. Um, you know, bad ideas don't don't allow them here. Um, so in my time at Catholic, this was kind of a change from our prior culture. But I have never said to anybody, "You can't invite a speaker." Anybody who wants to come, fine, love to hear you. Now, for the people that we're hiring, we have a different kind of project going on. So we're interested in hiring people to build our project. But, but man, you can talk about anything. I. I and I think that's inviting too, because it treats people who have different ideas as equals, 
um, and and makes a conversation. He, um, it's inviting in the following way. Um, two or three years into my time uh, as being president at Catholic, in, in my first year at Catholic, in fact, on my first day of work, I went to visit the vice president for student life. And we had co-ed dorms at the time. And I said, Sue, um, this is over. We're into these co-ed dorms. Uh, you can take a year to do it, figure out a way to do it, but we're not doing that anymore. Um, about two years later, there was a really, the, uh, Michelle Borsina writes about education for the Washington Post, about education and religion. Um, he got wind of, uh, I forget, uh, there may have been a story on NPR first, but it was in NPR and in the Post, it was a big story. Uh, about how the number of Muslim students at Catholic University had doubled. Now we're talking about the law of small numbers. You know, um, there there were maybe 200 uh, rather than 100 uh, in the course of in the course of 15 months or so. And they thought, well, that's strange. So they came out to interview the uh, the students, and um, he, uh, most of them are Saudis, uh, fairly orthodox, and um, uh, so. She said to the students, uh, what's up with this? I, you're Muslims, don't you like behead Catholics? And they're Catholics, didn't they like do the Crusades? And you know, and, it, and uh, they said, God, no, we love it here. We're like not weird. I, I, um, the women cover their heads, they have nuns that cover their heads. We pray five times a day, they go to daily mass, we fast during Ramadan, they fast during Lent. They like get us, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's not Islam, but it's, you know, they know what we're talking about. They know why we're doing that. At an American university, you know, where we get least common denominator, let's not talk about religion, you're weird. You're, you're weird as a Muslim, you're weird as a Catholic if you do religion there. So, so doing our own thing is inviting to people who do similar things or who have an interest in that kind of thing. And um, uh, so, uh, I think that's the kind of invitation we have to extend. It's not, let's water this down so that we all believe in um, a higher power of some kind. No, we believe that Jesus came and gave his life to save the world. That's what we believe. I, I know uh, you all think he's a great prophet, but we think something different. I, um, that's the kind of conversation we need to have. Uh, yes. Thank you, um, Mr. Garvey. Uh, I'm, I'm a faculty member here. I'm in the philosophy department. I was very interested at the beginning when you said that you thought that norm number four, I happen to have this in front of me, was the most important, that you need, um, a, um, that the number of non-Catholic teachers not be allowed to constitute the majority within the institution. Um, I just wanted to... Uh, uh, read a couple other lines very briefly from Ex Cordia Ecclesia and just get your comment on them. Uh, I wasn't, uh, I'm a little dissatisfied with the puzzle uh, example. Uh, I see what I see what you want it to do, but a puzzle, puzzle making is extremely non-hierarchical. Uh, there's no sort of, uh, yes, you're all working to put the puzzle together, but you're not, no, no one puzzle maker has any a larger role to play than any other. So I wonder whether that's an image you want to keep going with or not, that's just for your consideration. But I'm always interested in that question, you know, wh well, what would a Catholic architect or, uh, look like? Or what would a Catholic architecture school look like? What would a Catholic of this, a, a chemist look like? So I just want to give you these lines and see what you would do with them from Ex Corde. So two lines. One of them says this, uh, university teachers should seek to improve their competence and endeavor to set the content, objectives, methods, and results of research in an individual discipline within the framework of a coherent world vision. So this I like very much. It seems that there's good stuff there. So you could ask a chemist, for example, that you're hiring at a Catholic university, how do you see your work as set within a, what we might call a coherent world vision? I would consider that to be animated by faith and frankly by metaphysics in some way, even if the person can't use the word metaphysics. Uh, and the other one is uh, that I've always liked very much from Ex Corde, this line. 
In the communication of knowledge, emphasis is then placed on how human reason and its reflection opens to increasingly broader questions and how the complete answer to them can only come from above through faith. It seems to me that it would be legitimate at a Catholic university to ask someone you're hiring in any, any discipline, uh, how would you refer students to, uh, uh, to other disciplines? How might you refer them to philosophy, even if you can't answer a philosophical question yourself or a theological one? How might you be able to refer them to broader questions? So I, I'm, I offer that to you, and I would very much appreciate your reflection on those couple of texts. So um, let me say something about the first of those points which you mentioned, which I actually tend to agree with myself. I, I, um, uh, you said that the Republic of Science is non-hierarchical, and that, in fact, is the point that Polanyi was trying to make. He was arguing against hierarchical control of... Um, in the same way, I find Ex Corde Ecclesia itself and the bishop's application of Ex Corde Ecclesia in the United States to be exceedingly modest proposals in precisely the same way. Pope John Paul in Ex Corde says, look at, um, we really believe in academic freedom, and I'm not kidding. Uh, the bishops say, we really believe in academic freedom. He says, um, it's not for us to say what the business of a university is, we're bishops. We're not, I mean, he was actually an academic himself, as was Benedict, but you know, as a rule, popes are not academic guys. And the same is true of our bishops, for the most part. Um, things would go very badly if they tried to run the universities, and for that reason, which is among other reasons, why I've never said no to anybody who wanted to uh, come to campus to speak. Um, they said, the only thing we insist on is that in building a Catholic culture, you get a bunch of Catholics who are serious about being Catholics to do it. Otherwise, you're not gonna have a Catholic culture. You're gonna have Keynesian economics rather than, or something of the sort. So um, he, he, uh, that's what I um, particularly like about um, his Republic of Science and about the governing authority of scientific opinion. Because he doesn't say that there aren't rules and that anything goes. In, in fact, he says, there is such a thing as scientific opinion that tells us whether this is a good invention or not, whether this is a good idea or not. There will be things that deviate from it, and the only way of telling whether these are original creations is to ask all of these people who have the same vision of what science does. And that translates very nicely into the way I think our Catholic universities ought to be run. Um, as for the other points, um, yeah, I, um, uh, one of the things that I love about uh, Providence College and about my own school is uh, that they take seriously the role of philosophy and theology in the education of everybody who goes through them. I, uh, you know, whether they're chemists or musicians, um, uh, understanding the larger world or the larger view of the world in which their discipline operates is something that's informed by philosophy, theology, and so on. And it's not just uh, a game that philosophers play. It's actually connected to um, to what to how you ought to live your life as a musician or an economist. Or yeah, no, I um, I love the passages that you we're referring to. So, Thanks. yeah, I'm oh. in the back there. Uh, I've got the talk on stick. Sorry. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, thanks for being here, President Garvey, and, and congratulations on your, your tenure. As, People always uh, congratulate you when you're leaving. It's, it's something I've started to notice. <laughs> Finally got out. Got you out. made it. <laughs> uh, uh, you, you noted the, um, the increasing secularization uh, of our culture. And as that tenure comes to an end now, I'm interested in any reflections you might have on uh, recruiting, hiring, and retaining that kind of Catholic faculty that you note is so important to creating that, that Catholic university. Uh, you know, as, that, as the world gets more secular, so the pool of those kind of, of 
academics and professors who understand their vocation precisely as a vocation and who can contribute to the building up of that Catholic university will grow smaller as well. So after uh, these years leading Catholic university, uh, how'd you do it? I, you know, um, I used to have rosier views about this than I do now. I, um, I used to think that every Catholic university ought to operate this way. I, I, I now think uh, your question suggested that there aren't enough of them to go around. Uh, so um, now, uh, if it helps, um, any number of those schools are circling the drain and <laughs> won't be around, so <laughs> there won't be so much competition for them. I, I, um, on the other hand, I have to say uh, that I'm continually heartened by these kind of spontaneous um, developments that, or the, the seemingly spontaneous developments of really interesting uh, Catholic intellectual stuff going on. I, the Eastern Province of the Dominicans, who have a house of studies right across the street from us, man, they're on fire. I just, I love the smart guys that they're bringing in. I, they're just, they're killing it. I mean, as a... You so. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing with the Ann Arbor Dominicans. You know, I remember uh, Mother Assumpta Long was the was the the sister who started this house. I went out to visit her about a dozen years ago because I wanted her to send more of her young women to Catholic University to get educated. And they had 134 uh, women in uh, the Dominican sisters in Ann Arbor. The average age was below 28. One of them, uh, she said, you see that young lady over there um, uh, at, at Harvard at the commencement, not the law school's commencement, but the college's commencement, the valedictorian in, in classics gives a Latin oration at, at commencement. This young lady had given the Latin oration at the Harvard commencement. She's now Sister Maria Veritas, get it? I, I, uh, and getting her PhD at Catholic in, in, um, in Bible stuff. Uh, really smart people and they're just you know we, uh, we have a bunch of them living on our campus uh, in the women's dorms and they are the best advertisement for the religious life you know happy thriving smart uh, um, or to take another example I've talked to my kids often about this about the difference between Boston where I lived and Washington where I live now in Boston most people are Catholic you know the majority of the of the great and general court in Massachusetts is Catholic, but they're, um, the, the Jeannie said, my wife's a convert, uh, she's more of a Boston Brahmin, but she's become a Catholic, but she said, you know, these Catholics in Boston are just so insecure, and I think it's about the Brahmins, you know, they're afraid to say, this is what we believe, oh no, we're, we're, we're no different from you, we'll, we'll Abortion, yeah, that's we're we're for it. I, I take your pick. What, um, whatever cultural issue is on the left in Massachusetts, they're for it. In D.C., where I live, mind you, ninety-five percent of the District of Columbia voted for Joe Biden, and ninety-three percent voted for Hillary Clinton. So it's a you know left-wing town. It has a fabulous Catholic culture. Part of it's about Catholic University and a few people from Georgetown, but uh, but great. Um, <laughs> Great high schools, uh, uh, the Heights and Oakcrest, Brookwood, Avalon, really serious Catholic high schools. The Catholic Information Center is all the smart young professionals uh, go there. The think tanks like the Ethic and Public Policy Center, the Heritage Foundation are run by Catholics. The American Enterprise Institute used to be run by Catholics. They have a really lively Catholic intellectual life that's like out there about, you know, it's not it's not afraid of anybody, but they're they're who they are, so um, there aren't enough of these to populate all of the all of the Catholic universities in the country. But for places like us, like you, that really want to be serious about it, and um, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of good people out there looking for jobs. I want to thank you for coming and thank uh, President Garvey. Uh, there is a reception, so if you'd like to, 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 to continue the conversation in the great room, um, please join us there. <laughs>